Well, hello. Welcome to our virtual field day this afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'd like to thank everyone that has provided feedback so far from our previous virtual field days. We really are appreciating your comments and suggestions for improvement. Um, we are still working to protect perfect the technology side of things. Um, we have improved the audio quality over the last week and we're continuing ways, uh, exploring ways to improve the video quality for you, um, including here, let me readjust my video camera. Um, so we're working within the constraints of Zoom and are working to provide you with the best uh, experience that we can. So being in the field allows our speakers today, Billy and Adam, to cover and address additional items that they might not remember if we were just looking at still images and describing them. So that's why we are using the field recorded footage. There's a brief handout and I'll reshare that link in the chat window here momentarily that includes some details about the site that uh, we filmed at and also some helpful links uh, that are referred to during the discussion today. So I encourage you to take a look at that. I'm Liz Ripley, and I'm a conservation and cover crops outreach specialist at the Iowa Learning Farms. We're based on campus at Iowa State University. We were established at, in 2004, and our goal is to build a culture of conservation by working with farmers and researchers to implement practices that improve, improve water quality and soil health while remaining profitable. And this is thanks to our many partners that include the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, Iowa Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, US EPA Section 319, Conservation Districts of Iowa, Iowa Farm Bureau, Practical Farmers of Iowa, GrowMark, Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance, Iowa Corn, and the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. So please do ask that you mute uh, and turn off your video during uh, the times when our presenters are speaking, but we then encourage you once we open it up for questions that you can unmute and actually verbally ask your questions, or you may also use uh, the chat box, in which case I'll read those questions out loud. So please do encourage you to uh, unmute when the time is right uh, to encourage discussion and, and dialogue. So this is just the beginning. You will receive an email following this asking for you to give us feedback um, and share those ideas with uh, those that weren't able to join us today. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over here uh, to Billy to give a quick introduction and then we'll get started. Hi everyone, thank you Liz. My name is Billy Beck. I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. I'm also with the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management at ISU. Um, I'm responsible for forestry education extension over 99, all of 99 counties in Iowa. I'm also a member of the Natural Resource Stewardship Team, uh, which includes folks like Adam Jenke and a lot of other great water quality, wildlife and uh, fisheries folks. And uh, my background is in forestry and water quality, and you will often find me in riparian areas. So thanks for being here. All right, my name is Adam Jenke. Um, Thanks for joining us today, folks. Um, I share Billy's title, only he's the forestry specialist and I'm the wildlife specialist. We're both assistant professors in the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management and do uh, land stewardship education across the state. Um, my specialty is in wildlife and wildlife habitat, and so that's what I'm gonna be talking about uh, today along with Billy on all things riparian system oriented. So really look forward to your discussions and the conversation today. We of course wish we were actually out in a riparian forest with you, um, but since we can't do that, this is going to be the next best thing. We'll show you some footage of the riparian forest we tromped around in last week and then really look, look forward to the discussion with you all. So thanks for joining. All right. Um, well, a real quick overview for today. First off, thank you to Iowa Learning Farms for setting this up, hosting it, filming it, editing it. This is incredible. Uh, thank you everyone there. Um, we're gonna just take you on a tour of a, a local riparian forest here in Story County. Um, we've got four kind of segments and how it's gonna work is we'll play a video for each segment. Then either Adam and I will kind of add a little bit of content at the end and we'll have a little bit of time in between each video for questions. Um, but if you can't formulate your questions that quick, don't worry, um, we'll have ample time at the end to answer, answer your questions at the end of the, uh, the video series. Um, the goal today, we're not going to drop a bunch of heavy data and figures on you. 
We're essentially going to explore this riparian area and hopefully uh, install an appreciation of these areas. They're critical areas. They're often overlooked by, by folks uh, for their value, both ecologically and economically. And hopefully inspire you to get out and check these out, uh, engage in active riparian forest management, um, and just, again, start getting these on your radar as, as far as water quality and wildlife uh, habitat. So with that, um, I will introduce where we're going today. We are going to the Onion Creek Watershed, which is in Boone and Story Counties in Iowa. Some quick facts. It's 14,000 square acres total drainage. Within that, there's 42 kilometers of stream channel, which is pretty impressive. And every time I'm out in a riparian area or a stream, I kind of think of where is this going? Where is it connected? Um, if I do something here, what's it going to impact? So uh, Onion Creek drains into Squaw Creek, which drains into the Skunk River, which drains into the Mississippi River, which eventually drains into the Gulf of Mexico. So if I jumped in an inner tube, uh, you know, barring a series of dams, I would eventually make it down to New Orleans and the, in the, the Gulf of Mexico. So even the things we do here in Iowa impact, impact um, ecosystems many, many, many thousands of miles away. So um, like many Iowa watersheds, it's heavily altered, both land cover and hydrology, and we'll cover that today. Uh, it's very, very flashy, so it responds very quickly to um, precipitation events. It's about 86% row crop. Um, the forest acreage increases as you get down in the, in the drainage, but if you do follow the headwaters, if you follow the, the stream to the headwaters at Onion Creek, it starts as a drainage tile, like many streams in Iowa. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for common riparian tree species and invasive species in the background. See if you can ID uh, those. But with that, um, I think we're going to go and um, the four videos today will be ecology, um, wildlife, water quality, and then finally we're going to wrap it up with management. So with that, we can, uh, we'll start the ecology. When looking at streams and how they're formed and how they're shaped, when looking at streams and how they're formed and how they're shaped, the first thing I like to do is just look for areas of deposition and areas of erosion. One really neat thing to kind of look at when you're up at the top of a stream bank is the stream's plan form or how it looks as it meanders across the landscape. Is it very sinuous? or is it very straight? And you can see all kinds of areas of where sediment is being deposited and where it's being eroded. And that itself kind of forms the shape. When looking at scape, is it very sinuous or is it very straight? And you can see all kinds of areas of where sediment is being deposited and where it's being eroded. And that itself kind of forms the shape of the channel and has huge implications for forest management, riparian management, and wildlife habitat. One really cool example that I'm, I'm gonna see in here, this, the inside meander bend of this stream is called a point bar. If you look at the very top, there's a very thick deposition of sand right on top. So again, when you're looking at deposition and erosion, it's all about stream velocity. So when the stream gets up and exits its banks on the floodplain there, the velocity drops very, very quickly. And what that means is it's gonna immediately drop its heaviest sediment load, that being sand. So a lot of times along streams, we see this natural levee, a little bump of very, very coarse material before it moves out and the material gets very, very finer and the drainage poorer as you move back from the stream bank. So that really determines what species can live and it's a big gradient between the top of the bank and back into the floodplain. That has a lot of implications for forest management and what species you should be thinking about. So again, highly, highly variable soils and floodplains. It's both a, a blessing and also a challenge for forest management. On the reverse, you can't see, but there's a, a huge cut bank right here. It's a source of erosion. The, the stream is perpetually moving this way, this way, this way. And when this material erodes, it's gonna move downstream and get deposited on that next point bar. The diversity of processes in the stream that Billy talked about are the same factors that create a diversity of niches and other environments that are responsible for all the biological processing that goes on in stream banks, 
streams and riparian systems like water quality, flood retention, and wildlife habitat. And so in this stretch here, we see a sequence of what wildlife biologists call pool, riffles, and runs, which is where many aquatic organisms are adapted to life. And we also see overhanging vegetation, adjacent vegetation, and the floodplains, and all of those things create the environments that make riparian ecosystems so important. All right. Well, I just wanted to add a little bit to that and then kind of open it up uh, briefly for some questions and discussion. Um, I talked a little bit about stream shape and how the stream is shaped and how erosion and deposition influence that. And I just want to link trees to that, obviously being a forester. Um, so it kind of all starts with uh, this concept of stream power. So that's the capability of a stream to erode its banks and its bed material. So how powerful, how erosively powerful is the flow coming down the, down the stream there? And it's stream power is essentially the product of stream slope and stream discharge. So if you increase either stream slope or stream discharge, we've, we've done both in our watersheds in the state, you're going to get an increased ability for the stream to erode its bed and banks. So if you look, we talked about the sinuosity of, of the channels. A very sinuous channel is going to have a lower slope than a very straight channel. Um, so a sinuous stream is going to have less potential for erosion than a very, very straight, very straight stream and, and, and higher stream power. So where trees come in, and we see this all the time, when trees and the wood they produce either get transported from the floodplain into the channel or fall into the bank off the channel, um, they will redirect flow and kind of induce this meandering pattern um, of the stream, thus reducing stream slope. Um, other things they do when they do fall in, they will cause localized erosion, but that increased drag in the channel traps sediment, slows down flood flows, so really it does a lot to reduce uh, this, the overall stream power and the overall erosive nature uh, of, of stream channels there. So I just wanted to, to hit on that, kind of connect how trees influence uh, stream shape. And if next time you're out in a riparian area, start looking at the logs and stuff in the river and check out what's going on and the, the uh, um, processes that are going on right in that in that proximity. So with that, um, we can open it up to discussion real quick. I think Liz is going to keep us on track here with, with time for the next video. Yes, yeah, so a reminder, you can unmute if you'd like to ask a question or you can type it in the chat box. So it looks like we got one in here. Uh, as you mentioned, some of our prairie creeks begin with a field tile. Before the tiles were installed, where would our creeks, sim would our small creeks simply been wetlands that did not flow? Yeah, um, there's been some cool work here at Iowa State. Um, so kind of what we've done in our watersheds is we've increased the length of stream in the headwaters and we've decreased the length of stream in the middle sections. So in the headwaters, yeah, we ditched and drained all those wet areas, uh, wet prairie, and we created these stream channels to be able to till the landscape. And in the center part of the, the watersheds, which were once quite sinuous, um, we've channelized those, but they've kind of evened out over time. So the stream network is about the same, but we've increased stream length in the headwaters and decreased it in the center part. So yeah, good question. The answer is also variable across the state. If you look on the Des Moines lobe where there's been a lot, you know, especially a large amount of drain tile introduction, those wetlands were historically completely isolated just because they um, formed just 10 to 12,000 years ago with the retreat of the Wisconsin glacier. The rest of the state is much older glacially. Um, of course, the oldest uh, ter in terms of glaciation part of the state is northeastern Iowa and southern Iowa hasn't seen a glacier for hundreds of thousands of years. And, or well, well over, over 200,000 years, I guess I should say, a pre-Illinois and glacial period. And so those landscapes have had a lot more opportunity for erosion to occur. And so you find a lot more riparian systems in those parts of the state. And in North Central Iowa, yeah, a lot of it wasn't connected. It was not a dissected landscape um, because of the recent glaciation. All right, we've had a few more come in. Do grass covered banks erode less than heavily treed banks? Is there a proper balance? 
Excellent question. We just covered this. Again, it, it depends, which is the, the academic answer there. Um, so a lot of times, again, like what we're going to touch on today, it really depends on the hydrology of the system. Um, if it's a very altered system where the hydrology is, you, we're getting very, very massive flows and we're adjusting, the channel's getting deeper and wider, um, really that, that vegetation is not going to stop that adjustment. The thing about trees though, when that woody material does fall in, it does induce meandering and it does eventually kind of um, speed us up to a point of more, of greater stability. But in general, I would say that you really need a combo. You need those trees, especially on tall banks, um, for the roots to, to get into the soil and stabilize the soil. You also need grass um, to prevent against fluvial or, or the power of water eroding along the banks, um, as well as insulating the banks from temperature extremes, freeze thaw in the winter, wet dry in the summer. Um, which can cause erosion of those soils and, and sloughing of the soils too. So that is a very good question. It really depends. Um, I think um, when it comes to this, and I think Adam brings this great point up too, is um, are we splitting hairs or should we just really be focusing on, okay, let's get some kind of perennial vegetation on our stream banks. All right. So this is a family farm in South Central Iowa. If the creek banks are way steeper than what you showed, what does that mean? And if there is an old coal mine shale pile next to the creek, how does that affect things? So there's two questions there. Okay, so if they're steeper, how does it affect it? Um, if they're steeper, they're going to be much more unstable. And that again depends on the stream bank material. Is it very cohesive or is it very, you know, if it's tall like that, I'm sure it's very cohesive. Um, the shale is gonna add a little bit of instability. I've seen this in central Iowa with the coal mines. Um, shale, obviously the platelets there are a little bit of instability to that, to that stream bank. Um, but yeah, those tall banks, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but they have a huge impact on everything from the water table level to stability, to um, the health of the riparian forest, uh, to floodplain connectivity. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that uh, here shortly, but excellent question. And maybe you want to address this one later too, but is there a situation where tree trunks and branches should be removed? Yeah, if they're threatening some kind of infrastructure or um, if they are, this material will cause localized erosion, but on, on the reach scale, on the watershed scale, it does a net positive for reducing erosion. But if you do have some, that are, that are potential to induce erosion where you don't want it, then I would recommend removing it. However, I never recommend anybody getting on a stream bank with a chainsaw. Um, so, you know, just be careful and cautious when, when doing that. So like a lot of people, this person commented that they've lost a lot of ash trees. They just planted a bunch of saplings, silver maple and shell bark hickory, about 25 of each. Are these decent replacements for their fallen ash trees? Yes, I mean, ash is potentially on its way out. Um, I wouldn't start removing all your ash unless it's a, you've got a, a, a significant EAB infestation. But yes, um, any kind of um, riparian tree that mimics ash's structure and function, which is in the near bank region, uh, is a good replacement, so. All right, we're gonna take two more questions and then show the next video. I think we assume that stable banks are the goal, but is the meandering a needed or beneficial process? Definitely. Uh, the meandering definitely is a needed process. We kind of are obsessed with locking the channel into place and we, we, uh, we kind of um, equate that to a, a properly functioning uh, riparian area, but streams move. They move all the time. It's part of what they do. Um, we've accelerated that greatly, but Meandering and uh, the erosional depositional processes that we showed are definitely a good thing over time, um, but we need a suite of practices to also slow down the, the hydrology as well, so. All right, final question before we start playing the next video. How would erosion differ from locations in the North Raccoon when compared to the Des Moines River, like in Ledges State Park? Say it again, Liz, sorry. So how would erosion differ from locations like the North Raccoon when compared to something like the Des Moines River 
that's flowing through Ledges State Park. Well, again, you've got different topography and like Adam said, you know, different ages of, of drainages and different stream bank materials. So say in um, oh, Southern Iowa, you've got a lot more lust component of your, of your stream bank soils that could be a little bit more prone to erosion than say Central Iowa with a, a heavier or less, less lust component, glacial till derived. So yeah, geology always matters um, in these situations. So really, uh, how cohesive is the soil? How readily will the bed downcut? Um, so yeah, it definitely is a, is a huge factor. And that's why we don't wanna have a, a straight message across the entire state of Iowa. The Northeast is very different from the Lust Hills, it's very different from Lee County. So yeah, it all comes down to geology and, and kind of bank uh, soil composition. All right, so we're on to our next video, which is focused on wildlife. Riparian forests are really Riparian forests are really important for Iowa's wildlife. They're our most common forest type across the state because it's an area where even prior to European settlement and then today, we just don't tend to see many disturbances there like historically fire or grazing and today like crop or development. And so we have a lot of riparian forests in the state and wildlife are really adapted to those areas. Here on this riparian forest that we're exploring in the field day, we see a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, what I think is the most remarkable is right behind me here in this cottonwood tree is a nesting colony of great blue herons. And so these are what we call colonial water birds. They all nest in a neighborhood together uh, in a tree and they'll be up there for the next 40 days or so. Uh, laying, building their nests, laying their eggs, and then raising their young uh, before their young are ready to jump out and go feed on wetlands and lakes in places where you probably are more accustomed to seeing great blue herons. While we've been exploring out here, we've seen a lot of other wildlife and signs of wildlife. We saw a nest of a Baltimore Oriole left over from last year. Uh, we saw an actively nesting red-tailed hawk. We saw a crow's nest. We saw swallows starting to construct their nest in the steep eroded banks uh, in one of the meanders that we were exploring earlier. And then of course there's aquatic life all over riparian systems uh, living in the streams itself uh, in different areas uh, in pools or behind log jams or in rocky areas and then in ephemeral or short-term or short-lived water sources in the floodplain. So we found an oxbow area that wasn't wet today but surely during snow melt or during periods of high flow, water gets into it and it can be important area for reproduction of reptiles and amphibians or uh, even some fish use oxbows for parts of their lives. So different types of riparian forest attracts different types of wildlife, but riparian forest, because of the integration of the terrestrial environment and the aquatic environment, right together on the landscape tend to be really productive and hot spots of uh, wildlife diversity in Iowa. So in preparing for this presentation, it's sort of um, in reflecting on where riparian forests occur in Iowa, it occurs to me that the vast majority of our forests in Iowa are associated with riparian areas which is interesting because that would have historically actually been the case as well. Iowa was of course the tall grass prairie state, over 80% of our land area was in tall grass prairie. And when we think about wildlife management, we think often of managing for grassland landscapes, but the forested environments are where we have a lot of biological diversity. We have a lot of bird diversity. All of our bats, uh, all nine species of our native bats are found in forested areas. And then many of our reptiles and amphibians uh, are associated with riparian areas through parts of their life cycle. So even though they only take up a relatively small portion of our landscape, and at the time of European settlement took up about the same proportion of our landscape, um, these areas are really important uh, places on our farms and, and uh, in our cities to have wildlife. We wanted to sort of feature wildlife as a component, and so we can take questions on wildlife and wildlife habitat here um, in this section, and then we can also revisit it when we talk about managing riparian areas in the fourth section for wildlife. So I do have a, a wildlife specific question that came in. Um, this person 
mentioned that they've never seen any fish or crayfish in their stream. Is that normal? Um, it would depend on the nature of the stream. It probably wouldn't be normal because normally we say if, you know, um, the niche is available, something's going to take advantage of it. Um, you know, in terms of fish, some places in Iowa, we have barriers to fish dispersal, uh, mainly just uh, dams, any sort of artificial um, dam in the stream. And that can inhibit uh, what we call dispersal of fish up into uh, headwater areas. And it's a focus of conservation efforts around the state is to try to identify low, particularly low head dams uh, that maybe served a purpose years ago, but today don't serve a purpose and just uh, actually inhibit the dispersal of many native fishes. Um, the other thing that could limit, you know, occurrence of fish or crayfish would be how permanent the water flow is. So Billy mentioned uh, that this is a perennial stream that we're looking at. And that means that water is always flowing in it. I mean, it would have to be a really remarkable drought for this part of the stretch of the Onion Creek to go dry. Um, but of course, ephemeral streams are important and occur throughout the state. And so in some cases, we may see less aquatic life associated with ephemeral streams just because their flashy nature isn't a good place to make a living if you're a fully aquatic organism. All right, this next one. Are there, it's a bird that's right up your alley. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Are there any songbirds, pollinators, or other wildlife benefits to trees like silver maple, cottonwood, willow? Yes. Yeah, there absolutely are. Um, so one, you know, is the nectar resource. Um, those trees, of course, all flower. We think of flowers being herbaceous plants, but woody plants are really important nectar resource for pollinators um, and other insects. Um, what, another question was about willows, and actually, I don't remember the exact number, but um, willows are at the top. I think they're second only to oaks. Don't quote me on that, but they're right up at the top in terms of the diversity. Or larval phases that they host. And so oaks are number one. They have the most number of species that moths and butterflies lay their eggs on and raise their young on. Uh, but uh, willows are right up there at the top as well. They have a lot of diversity. And then uh, cottonwoods, you know, play an important role. They uh, um, grow fast and colonize quickly and create young forests that many different species of birds use and other uh, organisms use. Uh, they grow up and they die fast too. I mean, the life expectancy of a cottonwood is like less than 100 years. And so you see these giant cottonwoods that hollow out and develop all these cavities and everything else. And those can be a place that wildlife, particularly in riparian areas, really take advantage of. So these are, uh, yeah, really, really important, really often used uh, tree species in our riparian areas. All right. So this one is specific to bees. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of riparian and forested areas in the life cycle of native bees? Oh, well, that seems like a challenging question. <laughs> um, yeah, I will try to do my best, and I'll refer you to some good resources uh, if, if I uh, don't satisfy. But one thing that comes to mind is um, the, you know, we have over 200 species of bees native to Iowa, and they all have different life histories. They, um, you know, some of them um, are ground dwelling bees, some of them live in cavities, um, you know, they, have different nectar requirements or active different times of the year. So like one uniform answer isn't going to be feasible. Um, but I can think of the example of the rusty patch bumblebee, which is our this is a endangered species listed on the Federal Endangered Species Act and found in eastern Iowa. And their life history is really interesting because they actually thrive where prairie meets forest because they use the forest to overwinter and they use a period of their life cycle or spend a period of their life cycle, particularly this time of year, before the prairie is in bloom, in the forest, taking advantage of ephemeral wildflowers and other nectar sources found there. And then later in the year, as the colonies start to grow, they forage mostly in the prairies. And so again, they thrive at this prairie and forest uh, interface. And as I mentioned, riparian systems are where the prairie meets the forest, because that was the area historically that uh, would have gone out into prairie areas that were maintained by persistent grazing by bison and elk and, and also uh, fire lit by Native Americans or by natural like lightning sources. 
uh, that wouldn't have gotten into the riparian systems because it was wet and the topography wasn't favorable for fire uh, and trees thrive there in our prairie environments. So that's where a species like the rusty patch bumblebee would have evolved that really unique life history of needing both prairies and forests together. Uh, and of course, because most of our forests in Iowa today are riparian forests, are native bees that rely on nectar resources and forests uh, really benefit from them. And if I didn't get into enough sufficient detail on the bee question, you should check out Xerces Society uh, and some other resources online that have an increasing volume of really fascinating information about bee diversity in the Midwest. All right, so we've got three more and then we'll play the next video. So up next we have, are there any rare or endangered species of note in these riparian areas? Sure, yeah, so the, um, the one that comes to mind in terms of endangered species would be like the Indiana bat. That's a federally endangered mammal um, in Iowa. And they, they, along with all of Iowa's other bats, really take advantage of riparian areas for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, again, they are where we find forests in the state. So we find bats where we find forests. And so uh, there's, um, that's one reason. But the other and the more important reason is what I talked about in the video, and that's the unique coupling of aquatic and terrestrial environments. And when those two ecosystems occur in the exact same spot, you get increased productivity because they have this mutually beneficial relationship. So there's insects that come out of the aquatic, you know, have aquatic life phases and come out of the aquatic ecosystem into the terrestrial ecosystem throughout through their life history by turning into adult flying insects. And all of the bee or the bats that forage on the terrestrial insects take advantage of those and then take those nutrients back into the terrestrial environment. And then the terrestrial environment deposits nutrients back into the aquatic environment. So it's just like really cool flux. So bats need forests, but bats really need riparian forests. And bats are one of our uh, premier species of conservation concern in the state. We also have many other forest dwelling wildlife that are of conservation concern because we've lost. Um, much of our forest in the composition of our forest, not we haven't lost much of our forest. We've changed the composition of much of our forest and it's shifted toward away from uh, sort of a diverse early successional um, oak hickory um, community into relatively less diverse uh, communities that sort of thrive in the absence of disturbances. Um, and so we have many species of birds and other wildlife that are uniquely adapted to those uh, communities. Pileated woodpeckers, um, I, you know, you could go on. Lots of, uh, lots of different bird species that are uniquely adapted to these riparian areas. All right. I'm not sure if this is Billy or Adam or both, but how do beavers affect stream ecology? Um, let's, it's a great question and let's let Billy riff on this one because this will be fun. Billy likes this question. Uh, huge. And really, um, they've been studied extensively in the Northwest and the East and in the upper Great Lakes, but in the Midwest with our very unique watersheds and hydrology, there's not a whole lot of data on them, but they do a lot of great things both to the, um, uh, the riparian the terrestrial aspect of the riparian area and the, the, the stream itself. So they uh, essentially do kind of what we've been talking about. They slow the flow down, they block water up, they raise the water table in the riparian areas, which is, increases vegetative diversity and you know um, species composition. They allow, when they slow that water down with their dams, they allow for sediment to be trapped, they allow for velocity to be um, dropped. They also allow for denitrification and nitrate removal uh, in our streams as well. Um, they induce meanderings. You know, when those, again, when those dams break and then get cut around, that is an introduction of, uh, of meanders into the system. And I'll kind of segue to Adam, but every time we go out and visit dams, we kick up an incredible amount of wildlife, both, you know, things we can see in the pool itself um, birds, mammals, we had a, a time-lapse camera on a dam and it was just incredible the amount of wildlife that used these areas, um, feeding for bats, you know, insects emerging from the pool. So uh, big, 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 uh, they slow the flow down, uh, the trapping sediment, um, denitrification, raising water tables, they, they do a ton of, of positive 
positive uh, impacts. They can be problematic in our altered systems though. So I know it's, it's a contentious issue. There's a potential to drop, block drain tiles to um, damage riparian tree plantings. So, um, but I think overall they need to be kind of more recognized as a, as a net positive in our water quality efforts. But yeah, wildlife kick up yeah. tons of wildlife and dams. Right, yeah, and they, beavers are, you know, skilled at creating wetlands and landscapes that erosion has gotten rid of them all. Because, you know, we think of like Iowa where we find the most wetlands is in the Des Moines Lobe, those like relatively young glaciated landscapes. Uh, in, in the old landscapes where time and lots of, you know, flood events and lots of erosive properties have eventually just led to the, the loss of most, uh, most wetland environments, beavers are the ones out there fighting the good fight and putting wetlands back out on the landscape. And those wetlands, of course, you know, historically at least, and those wetlands create conditions suitable for unique, you know, growth of early successional forests, or they create aquatic environments that other species need to complete their life history and other things. So they really are, I mean, they're literally the textbook example of a keystone species, um, but they, uh, they certainly play that role, at least historically in Iowa's landscapes. All right, so, I'm going to hold on to a few more of these questions that came in later, but this last one we're going to talk about before we play the next video is, do you think the murder hornet will chase out other types of pollinators? And if so, what effect does that have on our ecosystem? And if you want to, to refer to Randall, Randall Cass, uh, now would maybe be the time. <laughs> sure, I'll do that. I'll defer. Or unless, Billy, you have opinions about the murder hornet. I actually, I don't know if the question was serious. I actually haven't been following the ecology of that, and so I can't really speak to it. But I do like that it's come up now. All right. So again, I've got your questions here. I'll hold on to them. And uh, we're going to move on to the next video. And we'll come back to questions. I want to stress the importance of properly functioning floodplain forests. I want to stress the importance of properly functioning floodplain forests and also the connection between the channel and those forests. When the channel is allowed to regularly flood these areas and these, these floodplain forests and well-managed riparian areas, it does wonders for water quality, water quantity, and also wildlife, aesthetics, timber value, and all the great things that are associated with these areas. As the water gets up and is able to access this floodplain, the velocities drop dramatically in the flow due to these upright stems of the trees. That allows for sediment to fall out. A lot of times phosphorus is associated with that sediment. The water that's left over, pooling and oxbows and little depressions, those are areas for denitrification and nitrate removal. Trees have many benefits uh, to water quality when they exist on stream banks. If you start even from the roots down here, those roots add tensile strength to the soil. So really prevent that fluvial erosion uh, from washing the, the banks away. Another cool thing they do is roots, they draw moisture out of the soil as the tree transpires. Removing moisture from the soil really helps add soil cohesion, again, preventing that water from washing it downstream. When, tr when roots grow, those fine roots as they enter the soil, as they cycle carbon into the soil and all the other microbes and exudates of the, of the roots, that adds to soil aggregation. Again, adding to soil cohesion and lessening the chance that these banks are gonna be eroded. Another neat thing too is when they do hang over the stream, they shade the stream and cool the stream temperature, the stream water temperature. This prevents those wild temperature swings from day to night if it was, to, if it was open, and that can have an influence on those wild DO swings as well. Well, I just wanted to add something about, Adam really touched on it and, and said it nicely before, um, just to reemphasize the importance of connectivity between the channel and the, the riparian forest and the floodplain. Especially in these smaller systems, the channel is very, very closely um, reliant, really, on energy inputs from, from the riparian forest that's adjacent to it. it inputs of carbon, um, wood, detritus, um, and it's, it goes vice versa too. That riparian floodplain from the channel gets inputs of nutrients, sediment, fresh sediment for, for tree uh, germination and other things. Um, so every time we're in there working, you need to you know, kind of be cognizant of, okay, 
is what I'm doing going to kind of impact that that connectivity or impact the uh, the input uh, the needed inputs from riparian zone into the into the stream and another cool one that Adam brought up was that is the insects you know that's another form of energy transfer from the stream to the riparian forest they emerge they're eaten and then that energy is now transferred to the, to the terrestrial landscape if you head downstream say to memphis in the mississippi river that river uh, is a lot less reliant on the, the immediate adjacent riparian forest for energy inputs a lot of its energy comes from within and cycling and sources within so um yeah very very closely connected the, the channel and the uh and the riparian forest in these smaller smaller systems <clears throat> And before we asked, we talked about bank height and what does, uh, you know, excessive bank height do is it, it almost precludes but the largest events from accessing the floodplain. So we really have a, a lot of our systems are highly disconnected between the floodplain and the channel because of the alterations and because of the, the channel incision. So. All right, so some questions that we had come in. Um, my stream buffers, they're in CRP, are invaded by willows. Um, owner likes them, but they're frowned upon by uh, our agency partners. Is there a way to encourage will willows closer to the stream to cut the stems and use them for stream bank stabilization or gully control? Um, if not, is there a way to encourage them to be less invasive? Well, they are definitely... Um usable for stream bank erosion control, like you said, in gullies. Um, we have an, actually a publication on that as well, uh, forestry extension. Uh, but if you cut the willow, um, I'll call them blanks, but willow stems when they're in the dormant season in say March, uh, bevel the edge and insert them about four fifths of the way into the, into the soil, making sure that the tip uh, remains moist. They're gonna grow roots from the base and shoots from the top, very, very rapid kind of um, um, three-prong attack against erosion. You've got the root stability, you've got the surface roughness from the leaves, and you've kind of got that deep, that dewatering. So as far as uh, control of woodies, you know, anything in your CRP contract, uh, those love fresh, newly deposited sediment, they require that and a lot of light uh, for germination. So if any Anytime you can just kind of capture that area with the the, uh, the native grass or whatever CRP species are in your in your mix, um, you're going to prevent those those willows from from germinating there. But willows are doing what they do. If they're they're an early successional species, and that's that's kind of what they do. So it is a challenge. So this is kind of a combination of wildlife and maybe management coming up, but. This person mentioned that they keep their cows out of the riparian forest, but could allowing them in sometimes sort of mimic what the bison and elk did? I was going to ask Adam that. Because, um, yeah, I always heard that, you know, one cow for a thousand days is way worse than a thousand cows for one day. And then you think back, yeah, the bison showed up, they beat the heck out of the bank, but then they left. So I, I'll pass it to Adam. I'm curious if there's a middle ground where we, you know, me as a forester, we're taught to believe, you know, really, we do not want cattle in our riparian woodlands and any woodland, really, just because of the soil compaction, the damage to the, the base of the trees and whatnot and the understory. But is there some middle road where we can mob or flash graze it and still, you know, have riparian integrity? So I could try. I'm certainly not an expert on, on the subject, but I could try to just think through the uh, considerations in that. I think that, yeah, some grazing could help maintain that um, good stand of vegetation or uh, maintain some level of disturbance and prevent a site from like kind of getting lost. Um, Billy said, I liked that expression you used, Billy. I always think all things in moderation, like a little bit of grazing is probably okay. Um, we know in terms of water quality concerns with livestock in aquatic environments, we get concerned when the livestock are spending time in the water you know and because that's the way that we introduce bacteria into the water um, that can be problematic downstream and so um, we do like the idea of trying to control access to the water itself and there's of course cost share programs available through nrcs uh, to do those kind of things and even better yet real experts at nrcs that could actually consult on what that would look like and how to put it in 
Um, and so that would be a thought. I think what Billy mentioned about soil compaction and damage to the trees and other things is, uh, you know, historically we did not want livestock in the woods at all. Uh, today, I know some wildlife biologists, we go into the grazed woods and, you know, it does create heterogeneity. It creates more open forest structure. It creates more diverse understory vegetation and then things. And so if, Timber production isn't necessarily your goal um, in your riparian forests. It's, you know, allowing for some uh, controlled grazing in those environments may be a way that you actually could get, you know, some revenue um, or some forage value out of the land while also creating some nice open forest habitat for wildlife. So um, just kind of depends on your goals and, and what you're trying to get out of it. And then again, just try to keep the livestock from spending their day in July in the stream itself, if that's possible. Yeah, alternative water and shelter to reduce the loafing time is is good. So yeah. we do not want them in the stream. Yeah. Unless it's very controlled. We're going to go ahead and play our last video. A lot of times folks ask me, what the heck is going on here? We've got this very tall, very erosive stream bank out here, and what the heck can we do with it? And to think about why this is occurring, you got to kind of think back to the alterations we've done to the landscape and to our stream channels throughout the last 150 years. Uh, we've changed uh, land cover from prairie and forest to row crop, urban parking lots. So things that have lower ability to soak up rainwater and deliver it slowly to the stream. Another thing we've done is we've straightened our stream channels, which increases stream slope and really increases the power of that water in the channel. So we're getting a lot more water in the channel all at once. And the stream here is just responding to that. It has to accommodate that new flow. So it's getting deeper and it's getting wider. And what we see often is these massive, uh, very, very tall eroding stream banks. Um, besides height, the other reason this is eroding is because it really lacks vegetation. It lacks vegetation on the bank and it lacks vegetation on the floodplain. Um, that leads to a, a very susceptibility uh, to erosion. A lot of water quality and quantity issues we're experiencing here in Iowa are the result of the altered hydrology we've put in, in a lot of our watersheds. Um, we've talked before about um, slowing the flow. A lot of these systems are very, very flashy. They respond very rapidly to precipitation events. And if you look, the next time you're walking in a, in a riparian area, you could see debris above your head or even higher. That represents the last flood stage. So you can imagine the amount of power in that flow. So any way, way we can do, any practice we can do to slow those, those waters down is going to really enhance water quality and downstream flooding, uh, mitigate downstream flooding. Trees and floodplain forest establishment, management, and protection are an excellent uh, practice to do that. They're not the end all, but they are a critical component. Tree leaves intercept rainfall, saving that amount of volume from entering the streams and allow it to evaporate later. Uh, the stems themselves are critical. This upright rigid stem really reduces velocity and encourages sediment deposition in our floodplains. Phosphorus as well attached to that sediment. The roots act to increase the infiltration capacity of the soil or how easily that soil can soak up rainwater and then deliver it slowly to the, to the, to the stream through shallow groundwater. So trees, forests, forestry, especially in floodplain areas, really do good to enhance our water quality and flood mitigation in the state. As you dig into riparian soils, especially in riparian forests, you'll see a good deal of sediment deposition. Again, these upright stems really slow the velocities down and encourage deposition of sediment and phosphorus into long-term storage on the floodplains and keeping them from exiting our watersheds. That soil sample I showed, if you look back, it's almost like looking at tree ring rows. You can see individual flood events and how those trees have slowed the velocity and trapped that sediment and attached phosphorus. Active forest management in floodplains is very challenging. You're dealing with a very dynamic environment. We've got highly variable soils, both laterally and vertically. You get in fluctuating water table levels. You're getting flood events every spring and throughout the summer. Uh, but there's a high potential uh, for timber value and timber production here amongst the myriad of other things we'd, we'd seen today. Um, so it, in, these, uh, in these dynamic environments, planning and persistence are key. And actually a little bit of luck helps too. So it all starts really with working with your district forester or a private forestry consultant, any professional forester, 
There's programs like CRP and Equip and REAP out there to help you in these environments. But again, persistence pays off in these, in these dynamic environments and it starts and ends with, with working with a professional forester. Management of wildlife and wildlife habitat in riparian forest systems can uh, take many forms. Um, the most common challenge that faces wildlife habitat in riparian forested areas is invasive species. Like you can see behind me, it's almost just a wall of exotic honeysuckle. And uh, riparian forest systems are really vulnerable to invasion by exotic species because the frequent disturbances that come in create bare soil and create ideal conditions for uh, annual plants and then succession of many uh, exotic perennial plants. And then also the floodwaters bring exotic species with them. So uh, upstream neighbors may have invasions or come out of landscapes or something like that. And many invasive plants first show up in our floodplains and then start to create problems elsewhere. So uh, riparian systems can be really challenging for that. So we encourage forest landowners to look for areas to improve wildlife habitat and also timber production and other ecological functions in forested riparian areas by controlling problematic invasive species like this honeysuckle and then a litany of others. Just walking out here today, we've seen um, Europe, or European buckthorn, autumn olive, Japanese barberry, garlic mustard, and honeysuckle all growing in this floodplain forest and in some cases uh, creating real problems with understory vegetation or areas where animals may ordinarily forage or nest um, or just uh, making the system less resilient. And so management in those environments can be really important. Other ways that you can manage for wildlife in riparian forested areas includes like protecting unique features like uh, dead trees can be really good important wildlife habitat or nesting spots like the heron rookery we looked at earlier. We would want to protect the trees around that rookery and make sure that those herons can come back to it for as long as they uh, want to come back to it. Uh, and then also holes in trees, cavity uh, nesting birds and many other mammals and even some reptiles will use holes in trees. Uh, and so protecting trees that have cavities either created by woodpeckers or by bran broken branches can be a really important way to create riparian forest wildlife habitat. Yeah. So that's the last in our videos today. Um, what we want to do now just kind of take broad questions that you have in terms of managing your own riparian areas or what uh, your goals are, share your experiences with some of these systems as well. I've got a couple questions for you. I, this person says they have high, three acres of prairie grass that they burn every three years. It appears that brome grass is invading part of it. Is this usual? I thought prairie grass outcompetes other grasses. Do I kill the area and replant? It's a good question. Uh, it, it, of course, sort of depends on how severe the brome grass uh, invasion is. One, you know, I have the same question. I see these exotic monocultures able to invade otherwise diverse prairies that we've established, and you do wonder what, what conditions favor that. Um, I would encourage you to get with a, a private lands wildlife biologist with Pheasants Forever or Iowa Department of Natural Resources or Planning Conservation Board and get their feet on the ground to look at the site and to provide some recommendations. One, a few options may be uh, changing the timing of your fire. Uh, brome grass is an exotic cool season grass. And so it grows early in the season like our lawns do. Uh, and our native grasses, although we have some that are cool season, most of them are warm season. And so adjusting the timing of the fire may help uh, control it. And then otherwise uh, sort of trying to figure out where the brome invasion is coming from. I don't know if there's an adjacent like roadside or something that is, you know, sort of facilitating the spread, but if you could try to control that source as well, um, maybe another option. But I'd get some boots on the ground. We have lots of professional wildlife biologists in the state that are very skilled in uh, diagnosing and uh, solving challenges when it comes to managing wildlife habitat. And I'll post in the chat a link to find those uh, resources in your county. So I had someone comment uh, that utilizing goat, targeted goat grazing may help with that willow control. So something to keep in mind. 
All right, next question. Are there any specific silviculture practices that work best for in a riparian forest? So again, um, and maybe explain what silviculture is. Okay, um, silviculture is essentially um, altering or managing the growth of woody species to um, attain any of the objectives you want, be it wildlife, um, timber, water quality, recreation. So it's essentially kind of how do we alter the growth of these trees? How do we manage for different age classes to get what we want? Um, so in riparian areas, if you think back to the species that live there, um, they're early successional species. So to kind of get those regenerated and the next generation going, you really have to involve in what's called even age management. Um, and this is kind of unpalatable for a lot of folks, especially if you have a smaller uh, acreage. Um, you wanna you know, really create large gaps that allow sunlight to come in, um, removing patches, clear cutting of, of, of areas. Again, these, these species love disturbance. They regenerate through disturbance, such as flood events. Um, um, and again, that kind of speaks back to um, the connectivity with the channel. And uh, a lot of these species like um, very, very bare mineral soil to, to regenerate. So I would say for silviculture, you're gonna have to really work with even age management and creating large blocks of, of removals. Um, there's not a lot of uh, high value timber species that grow um, or shade tolerant uh, in these areas. So you're gonna have to open them up and get some light. But that's very challenging because they're very fertile soils, it's a very productive area, so you're gonna get a lot of competition through weeds. So um, we have a really good uh, pub on managing and floodplain forests. Like I'll put it up here in a sec, but it really comes down to a lot of luck and timing. Um, if you wanna get um, natural regeneration, uh, you gotta kinda time it when you wanna you want get the site prepped properly, controlled uh, with weeds the, the year before, and then kind of time when the silver maple and when the cottonwood and when the black willow are gonna be releasing their seeds uh, and then kind of have those two come together. Uh, but no, it's definitely a unique environment, uh, but even age management I think is, is the key in, in a lot of these. And again, it depends on your objectives. And again, I, it goes back to working with a, with a forester and planning you know, years ahead uh, for what you wanna do. So I'll, I'll try to get that pub up here. I think this question is referring to wildlife species. So which species should we try and attract to the stream banks with nesting boxes? Oh, it's a good question. Um, the um, and so that, you know, they are uh, cavity nesting birds and they use riparian areas because they raise their young in wetlands and other rivers and streams right after they hatch, they leave the box and, and go. So uh, finding, you know, putting up wood duck boxes can be good. Um, you know, Eastern bluebirds are kind of, are also a really common cavity nesting bird that like the interface between grassland, shrubland and forested areas. And so uh, again, riparian areas tend to look like that. So you could have Eastern bluebirds, um, black capped chickadees are really common. Wrens are really common. They all use boxes, uh, relatively small boxes. So. I'll post a link, uh, another link to the website for uh, some plans for boxes like that. And you can think about that um, for artificial structures that would attract nesting birds. All right, our next question has to do with um, harvesting in a riparian area. So uh, their district forester says it's ready to go. They're asking, what should we watch for as far as hauling ho out logs since you have to go through other forested areas? Last harvest we had in the contract uh, to only do it on frozen ground. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's huge, frozen ground. If you don't do it on frozen ground, A, it's, it's nearly impossible, but B, you're, you're gonna compact the soil like crazy. Um, we do have an, a very aged um, riparian area harvesting kind of best management practice publication, which I'm gonna eventually work to update. But um, a lot of other states have them, um, states that have more of a, an impact from harvest on just the scale of harvest on, on riparian areas. But I mean, really, I tell everybody just to kind of be very deliberate in planning your roads out and stick to those roads. Um, you get a lot of folks that just kind of spider web out and you're really, once you get that equipment out, even if it's frozen, you're gonna hit trees, you're gonna damage them. 
So even along roads, you're going to hit trees and damage them, but at least they're concentrated along just, just the road there. So um, another thing I've seen is um, try not to go directly vertical up hills <laughs> with skid trails and stuff. I've seen little valleys full of sediment resulting from that. Um, so again, I will try to uh, hopefully soon try to update that publication, but stick to your roads, plan them out with your forester, and then um, the forester will be there kind of oversee the, hopefully oversee the, the harvest. But yeah, it comes down to smart road planning and, and just um, even on the roads, you can do what's called water bars, um, which is in that publication as well, to kind of divert the water off of the road and not have it just barrel down the, the road um, all at once. So yeah, just be smart about your placement. Okay, we're gonna take two more questions and then wrap things up. What is the best resource for a list or identification guide of evasive plants and how to help manage the riparian forest on their property? Well, Adam, I'll let you uh, kind of describe the um, invasive species material we've recently put together. Yeah, I was the, I was hung up on in, in the best. I don't know that I'll claim that ours is the best, but we're trying. We'll put that into the chat. Uh, Iowa Department of Natural Resources has a really cool website as well um, that has, a, you know, a panel of just everything you could imagine. Uh, some of the different um, um, roadside groups around the state have some really nice resources. There's um, in Eastern Iowa, I think it's called Hawkeye. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, Hawkeye something, and they, and they have a bunch of resources about invasive species um, in Iowa. Um, so, and then if you're, so what I would, what I would encourage you, check out the website, the link that I just posted in there, that'll give you like Iowa's most wanted, like the most common. Um, those are the ones that I listed out there that we had seen um, on, on that site. Um, and then that'll at least train your eye to what you're looking for. We can definitely give you the most common. In terms of the up and coming challenges um, or the ones that aren't quite as ubiquitous across the state, um, I would go to some of those regional things. And like I said, the Iowa DNR list is pretty comprehensive, a, a list of invasive plants that are worth, worth, if you own land or manage land, it's worth training your eye to sort of be able to start anticipating uh, these invasions. All right, final question. Uh, this person's establishing young trees in their riparian buffer, but just started to experience problems with the beavers cutting the small trees. Can we implement control procedures under a deprivational plant permit? Um, a depredation permit? You, um, you could definitely do that. The, the way to get um, authorization to do depredation related control of beavers would be to work with the um, uh, depredation wildlife biologist with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. You could, of course, use a licensed trapper to trap beavers during the, um, uh, during the trapping season, which is during the fall and winter. Uh, but outside the trapping season, you need to work with a depredation wildlife biologist. So one more link. We'll post that in the, in the chat. You can click on your county and find the person listed under Iowa Department of Natural Resources depredation biologist, and that's your contact for getting a permit. A note on this, and I think this is, this is, Billy and I were actually having a side chat during the, uh, one of the videos about this, is this riparian management thing is like, what's good for the stream is not always necessarily good for the landowner. And so beavers are wonderful uh, organisms because they're, they're keystone species, creating all this habitat for other organisms and, you know, creating places for new forests to evolve or develop and all this wonderful things. But if they're creating, uh, if they're flooding out your basement or if they're flooding out your crops or something like that, even though it's good for the stream, it isn't good for the downstream or, or, or good for you. So uh, what we encourage folks to do is just kind of go through a process of like, can I tolerate this? Can I just sort of change my expectations for what I'm gonna have down here as the beavers start to change it and do what they do naturally? Or a lot of other organisms, of course, things you know, um, just change their environment. Um, go through that process, be open to maybe that is okay. And if in fact it's not, then of course go about legally and humanely doing uh, the things that we're allowed to do and that we uh, can do to sort of protect our property. So I hope that answered the spirit of the question. I just heard the part about depredation. I wanted to clarify what the rules were. Um, I don't know, Bill, you have something to add? No, I mean, it's, it's challenging. And if you watch them in the environment, they'll, they'll kind of denude an area of riparian timber one year 
and then just move on to the next, especially with fast growing species. And then three years later, they'll come right back when that, that species such as black willow is regrown. So um, aside from caging your trees, if they're high value, it's, it's tough. Um, it's really tough. So. And on that note, uh, I'm going to share my screen one more time. If you did attend for today's CEU credit that was applied for, please do email me by 5 p.m. today. Um, your full name, how you entered your name for watching this, and then I'll see your number. And I just want to give a brief shout out to our next event. Uh, virtual Field Day will be in two weeks on May 28th. We're going to be celebrating Iowa's wetlands um, in honor of wet American Wetlands Month. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, again, there will be an evaluation headed your, to your inbox later this afternoon. So thank you all for coming and have a great afternoon. Thanks, folks. Thanks, everyone.